Well, good morning. Uh, this is uh, the Romans Sunday School. So this is this is different. It's it's YouTube. This is not our usual platform. I don't even know if I'm going to have this setting like in my office type of setting for the rest of these at all. You know, when it comes to announcements, just pretty much just check the news. But uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I do plan on posting another video for Wednesday night at seven o'clock, so that should go um, be available to you uh, at the usual time on Wednesday, so you can watch that whenever you need to. I am really considering re-recording last Wednesday's uh, Facebook Live message because uh, I got all laggy and I was really disappointed in that, and I apologize for that, but. Uh, now that we've done this YouTube thing, it just seems much easier and there's no risk of that really uh, happening again, Lord willing. Um, basically, we're gonna try that route. So, yeah, so look for that video that'll be posted on Wednesday at seven o'clock. Um, before we get started, um, two things. Secondly, uh, I know I shared a, a verse from uh, the previous Wednesday on Ecclesiastes 3.1, that there's a time and purpose, and just our thoughts on this whole virus thing that's going on. Another thought about that, and this is kind of a weird context from Luke 17, because the disciples are really talking about forgiveness, and you know, all those times where you have someone that asks for forgiveness, and it's like the 30, 30th time for that same issue, and you get really aggravated about it, and Christ says, hey, if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and in seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And it's the way the apostles responded to Christ is what I think how we should respond through this as teens, as adults, as little kids. But the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. So during this stressful time, this weird moment of your life, uh, ask God to increase your faith in him. We're trying to have these videos out so people can still be fed by the word of God, but we're also encouraging you, hey, dive into God's word yourself. We are encouraging you to be strong in your own personal devotions. All right, now, um, I'm sure many of you are like, hey, wait a second, aren't you going to do your verses? And Lord willing, I am. I, I think I am ready. Um, we'll go for it and try my best. Um, I was going to blindfold myself, but then I found this travel pillow. And no, this is not one of those virtual reality technology pieces. This really is just one of those memory foam travel pillows. But yes, I'm going to put this over my eyes and attempt... Wow, I can like barely not hear anything. I'm going to snap this in place. Take two. Okay. All right. So I can't see anything, but you can hear me. Um, okay, Romans 8, 1 through, wherever I stop. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That we might have, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, here's the part where I get confused, like four and five, or five and six. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. All right, so that's my new verse. Hopefully that was all of them. Um, maybe I'll go look back and look, and maybe I missed one. I'm sorry if I did. And I'm sure I had a few gaps there and words off, but... Trying to do my best as an ordinary guy memorizing scripture. But by way of review, back to our Romans 6 lesson. We're just going to go through a few verses this morning. We were talking a lot last time about technical words. Okay, so justification. What does that mean? It means to be made righteous. 
Um, back in chapter 5, in verse 1 of chapter 5, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's, that's being made righteous because of what Christ has done. We talked about the word propitiation, which means satisfying God's wrath. That sin, one of the consequences of that is that God is disappointed. God is displeased. God is angry at the fact that we rebel against him and something needs to be done about that. So that wrath needs to be satisfied. And in the previous chapter, chapter 5, verse 9, it says towards the end of that verse, saved from wrath through him, him being Jesus. Uh, another word we looked at was atonement, and in this context, that's that's Jesus Christ dying as a substitute uh, for sinners, for us. Romans three twenty three for all of sin, we're all sinners. And lastly, imputation you get something that's put on your account. So in our terminology, you know, you get that check for your birthday from your grandparents. You take it to the bank or use an app on your phone and you scan it, um, and then that gets put on your account. So that's what imputation means. It's put on your account. And in Paul's context, in the biblical sense, um, it's Christ's righteousness that is put on our account. So it's, it's similar. It's tied with justification. I want to give the last three verses of Romans 5 as we jump into Romans chapter 6. So hopefully, hopefully you're already there. Uh, you have your Bible in front of you or on your phone and you're looking at uh, just the end of Romans chapter 5 as we jump into a new chapter. For as by one man's disobedience, and again, who is that? Adam. Many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, who is that? Christ. Shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense may, might abound. But where the sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Amen. Amen. Uh, that's why on Sunday mornings we sing, you know, grace that is greater than all our sin. And I can't sing, and I think I was trying to do a voice in flux there, and it was just bad. Um, verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul, again, you know, he teaches all this doctrine, and then he often just assumes how certain people are going to respond. And I like that because he's, he's, Paul's thinking of, in context, in reality, how people are going to respond to his teaching and his preaching. But he, he acts as though a person goes, great, awesome, we get the grace uh, of, of Jesus Christ that's imputed in our account just after we sin. Wonderful confetti, uh, just trumpets are, are, are blaring. And then it's like, well, I'll just sin then because I get Christ's grace onto my account. And Paul's like, no, no. And that's how people back then, a lot of them were thinking. And this is something he addresses in Galatians. It's like, no, that's, that's not the proper response. So what we see in Romans 6 is Paul basically saying, you know what, as a Christian now, this is what your life should be. This is how a Christian's life needs to be dominated by the Holy Spirit. So what you're going to see here a lot in Romans chapter 6 is Paul explaining, addressing this issue of, well, hey, no, my lifestyle doesn't have to change because whenever I sin, I'll just ask God's forgiveness and, and receive all that grace. That's not the Christian life. That is not how a Christian is supposed to live. So, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin, that grace may abound? God forbid. No. May it never be so. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Paul deals with this in Galatians 5.13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So God's like, he, he doesn't want to be treated like this ATM of grace. You know, it's cold, it's impersonal, it's lifeless. It's, it's a relationship that says, I only want to talk to you just to get forgiveness. That is such a terrible, terrible um, relationship. That's, that's not the biblical picture of what a Christian's life should be. Uh, A.W. Tozer, I quote him a lot. I really, really uh, like his books. But he writes, God wants the whole person 
And he will not rest until he gets us in entirety. Okay, so all of us. No part of the man or woman will do. God just is, doesn't want a part of our lives. God wants to be over all. Verse, um, verse 3. Know ye not. And so he's going to give a picture here. So this whole idea of I'm just going to sin so I get grace. It's bad. Where does he go right after that to prove that's not the way Christians should live? He, he, he references baptism here. Know ye not that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Wherefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. So he mentions baptism because it is a step of obedience. Sure, God commands for a, a new believer that, hey, you need to consider baptism because it's our public declaration that, hey, I'm on Christ's team. I'm putting the jersey in Christ. I'm on God's side, and I want to let everyone know that. Uh, it's We don't, as Baptists, view baptism as, okay, baptism... It earns you any salvation at all. No, you're identifying with Christ. And it's a public thing that's basically telling people that, hey, I'm on God's side and you believers out there watching me make this um, statement, I need accountability, I need help, and I want you to help me in my Christian life. That is what baptism is all about. And we understand that because the Christian life is a battle. Um, you teens know that when you play video games, uh, if you if you play online and you maybe you have your buddy on your on your team and you're fighting away and all of a sudden you look over and your buddy's like looking at the sky or he's just not moving and you're like on your headset and you're like, hey, watch out! If something bad just happened, you're, you're trying to get him focused in the battle. Um, it's the same when you're playing sports. If you're playing baseball, if you're playing football soccer, whatever, if your teammates out there are not doing anything, you're going to press them to be a part of the team. Get open so I can pass to you. Do something. Don't just be standing out there or don't just be sitting there on the bench. Participate. Get involved in the game. So this baptism that, that Paul is mentioning here is saying, no, my, my life is supposed to be different now. And we know, of course, in Pastor has been going through the whole series of Revelation, which has been fantastic. Um, as we look to the future, we know in Revelation 20 that, that, that we win in the end. But we still have battles here to face. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.24, If you're going to race someone, hey, race the win. Don't go out there with flip-flops and a, one of those dino costumes and expect to win the 100 meters. Okay, if you're going to participate, go all out. And that's what comes up in Hebrews, that, hey, uh, we have all these witnesses, all these other people of faith that have gone before us. Let's press on to that mark of that high calling. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man, now this is our sin nature, is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So, so much of chapter um, 6 here in Romans is about what your life is like now as a Christian and who you're serving. Because you're always serving someone, whether it's yourself and your sin nature, whether it's Christ. Who are you serving? A lot of times you hear the question, what's so bad about this? In essence, why can't I have this one area in my life uh, just for me. And, and we say that like we're, we're trying to hide something sometimes, like it's a sin issue that, okay, I have this one thing, but overall, you know, compared to everyone else or compared to everything else I do, it's not that bad. And we got to remember here that sin blinds us so much that we often picture it as this cute, cuddly thing that that's misunderstood but we need to see sin in its ugliness, in its depravity, in its destructiveness. When you look at the terms Paul uses here, it's verse 9, dominion. 
verse 12, reign, verse 17, and other areas in this chapter. We're slaves to sin, servants of sin, slaves to sin. We need a huge billboard in our mind when we think about sin, that sin has consequences. Sin has consequences. And it'll control you if you let it. I liked um, Rand Hummel's preaching as we went to the Wisconsin State Youth Conference. Uh, he's, he's known for saying this all the time. Sin will always cost more than you want to pay and take you further than you want to go. That is what sin does. We can't view it as something that's insignificant. We can't view it like something, oh, I'll just, I'll just pray and ask God's forgiveness. Like it doesn't have any consequences in your life, to your siblings, to your family, to those that, um, those that are married spouses. We gotta view sin as deadly. So having some secret sin in your life, you know, I think of this virus that we've we've heard nonstop about. Can't go on Facebook, can't go on YouTube, can't go on the news without hearing everything about this virus. It's interesting that the you can have this virus and not show symptoms and be a carrier of it for a few days before you know that you have it. And it's like, okay, in many ways, that's what sin is like, that we, we hide that secret sin and we don't always see consequences immediately. That doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean it won't, there won't be symptoms and consequences right around the corner. Sometimes God, even in his awesome, great, wonderful mercy, doesn't deal out consequences of our sin immediately. And sometimes he does. And I know every analogy breaks down after a while, but think about it. Think about it. Sin has terrible, terrible consequences. But as a Christian, you know, we're, we're, we're freed from that. We can be controlled by the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. And remember, we're crucified, that, crucified with Christ, bringing up the baptism analogy. We are dead to sin. We're buried with him. For he that is dead is freed from sin. And you might be like, well, Pastor Dan, I, I don't feel free. I don't feel like I have a strong relationship with God. And first, okay, something can be true regardless of feelings. There's always that. Um, for instance, I, I'm a dual citizen. Okay, so I have a British passport and an American passport. I, I feel more American because, as you can hear, I have an American accent, much to the chagrin of so many. Um, I live here in the States. I married an American, beautiful redhead. Um, so I feel more American, but in the same sense, I'm still a British citizen. I still have my British passport. Uh, regardless of what I do, I, I'm still both. Uh, I, I'm not more American after I... I'm not less British, I guess, after watching a, I don't know, a Tom Cruise action movie versus, you know, the great British Bake Off or Downton Abbey or something like that. So first, something can be true regardless of how you feel, but okay, is there something in your life that you're hiding from, hiding from God that you're trying to, to some corner that you're like, well, I have this one thing and I know it's kind of wrong, but I'm going to keep doing that. You know, that affects you, whether you like it or not, whether you tell yourself it doesn't matter or not, that impacts your life. And of course, there's consequences to sin that, that would play in a part with this. Second, um, yeah, I want you to think about that. Is there some area in your life that you're not giving to God? Is there something that just popped into your brain? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? If it convicts you, repent, rip it out of your life. You don't need it. It's not helping you. I know we're not supposed to be governed by feelings, but God does give us a peace when we have a right relationship with him. We've talked about that through this series, that the peace of God passes all understanding. But if there is an area, deal with that area. Talk to your parents. Talk to me. Talk to Pastor Schuler. Talk to someone that can help you if you're not helping yourself. If you, I know we, we, we try to take on these things in an uh, almost selfish, self-centered, I can take it on via me, but that's not the Christian life either. We're here as a team, a team. So let those that are spiritually perhaps greater, those that 
um, leaders in your life, parents, talk to them if there's some area you, that you're struggling with that you want to have victory over. God can grant that to you, not through pure willpower, but through the power of the Holy Spirit so we can have a changed life, that we don't have to be slaves to sin. Verse 21 talks about, you know, what fruit, and this is jumping ahead, I realize that, and we're just kind of closing up this thought uh, for this morning, but Paul says, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. He's saying, hey, look back at your past life in sin. Those things that you did, what were the results? They weren't good. They weren't helping you. It's the same now. We, we put these rosy glasses view on our, our, our sinfulness saying it's not that bad. It's not going to help. It's, it's not going to impact me. It's not going to impact my relationships. I can keep this under the carpet. It really does affect you. And Paul says, hey, you get fruit from that. You always get fruit from that. But we want to make sure that our fruit is good. Therefore, we need to follow God. We need to do things that don't make us ashamed. Uh, unlike a lot of these believers that we're reading about here. So, a few minutes uh, sharing with you uh, just a few verses from Romans chapter 6. We will look into uh, the rest of this chapter next time. But I encourage you, um, you can read ahead. It's all right. It's, it's okay. And hey, you can memorize portions of Scripture with me. It doesn't have to be Romans 8. But I really do encourage you to uh, hide God's Word in your heart. That's one of the things that we can do that helps us fight sin that the Holy Spirit can use. So um, I'm obviously not perfect, and I'm doing this as an ordinary guy. But I really encourage you to be in God's Word. Pick a chunk of Scripture out to try and memorize not for human rewards and candy or anything like that, but just because you want to have a closer relationship with God. So I encourage you to do that. And I look forward to sharing uh, the rest of Romans 6 uh, next time. Thanks for listening.